You've been incredibly generous in agreeing to part with some work you've held on to yourself and had intended to keep in your private collection. And I wanted to ask you a little bit about what led you to the decision to, that this was the right opportunity to put that work out into the world. This was a chance to have the context and have the narrative in an extremely non-hierarchical way. We're able to put a number of works that represent series and different bodies of paintings and sculptures in a way that I feel, you know, most meaningful towards. It's impossible to speak about your practice without realizing how sprawling and varied your approaches are. And it occurred to me that perhaps the project in general is in a way a self-portrait of America in the sense that this country itself comes from many places. As an artist in this day and age, there's so many things to pull from visually. There's a lot of things that are kind of formal and aesthetic scenarios that I find really appealing from a European perspective, you know, from an Asian perspective, you know, even from a Middle Eastern perspective, there are so many different things that I find appealing. In my opinion, that's kind of a, rep a representation of America. Throughout the development of your artistic practice, you're constantly able to slow down and look around and ask yourself what something is made of, what message the people around you are trying to deliver, and break that back down into its constituent parts and ask yourself whether there's something for you to do with those parts and recreate a new sum of those parts. You're absolutely right. In a way that kind of gives this anthropological or, or kind of like even archeological sense of looking at the past, the present, and, and potentially what might be the future of representations of culture. We're surrounded by seven different examples uh, of your work where in each case that synthesis has occurred. One of the earliest works in the grouping is the spray painting. As long as people have known your work, I feel like they've been aware of the spray painting as a significant aspect of your practice. You know, the spray paintings for me were very much a reaction to being in Los Angeles, how non-natural the landscapes and the sunsets and the sunrises were. A lot of different ideas about, you know, graffiti and how this societal kind of structure of graffiti led to, you know, neighborhood implications. And it was also a way for me to contend in a very formal way, you know, a rectangular plane that was just being cut across the plane and what does that do? It automatically, the kind of violence of that and the aggressiveness of that immediately creates horizon lines. And I kind of loved what the horizon line became, not just landscapes, but distance, implications of, you know, devastation. Do you recall when you decided to keep the painting? That kind of abstraction of them and where I've always wanted to go with these paintings was there. We have a brand new painting from the window series that you've just completed in time for inclusion in this project. I have been painting like just very, very um, heavy oil paint on raw canvas. And I had been disrupting that painterly gesture with these kind of hard lines of cardboard, textile, collage type elements. Was that an endeavor to utilize studio detritus to rehabilitate scraps from other projects in the studio? No, I've always been kind of interested in recycling and this kind of archaeology of the artist's studio. There were all of these mini paintings inside each of these materials. So you had what was happening on the raw canvas, which was a painting in and of itself. 
then you were getting another scenario of a painting on cardboard or on a piece of painted paper or a textile. The Helios landing painting is part of a very small series of yellow paintings. And this is one of the very first horizontal ones. Perhaps the most exciting and satisfying aspect of this project has been working together to find art historical sources or influential pairings to relate to your work. The alabaster work, which is from 2011, we've managed to pair with the Hokusai woodblock print of the Great Wave. You know, the alabasters came out of, you know, the ceramics and glaze the way that glaze runs during the, the kiln firing process. But the more we worked on them and the more we cut them out, I realized that they were kind of representations of oceans. And the middle of the series, kind of at that point where I started to have a little bit more of, of a grasp on how to make them, they completely became Hokusai waves. It dawned on me that the Hokusai waves were this kind of beautiful synthesis of chaos and tranquility, this kind of in between both. And really that's what I had been trying to do with the ceramics and the, the urethane sculptures all along. The Alabaster series was really the first time where these things came together um, in, in a painting. Knowing our shared relationship or interest in Mike Kelly, it's difficult for me to, to look at the vampire work without processing it through that prism. I liked that Mike was taking these faith-based gifted objects and running them through the ringer. I came from, you know, very heavy textile and sewing backgrounds. I wanted to make something as iconographic as the Rolling Stones lips or the Grateful Dead bear, but it had to be, it had to be something that would hold this kind of soft material, something that had political bite, but also resonated in a way that you could identify with it immediately. Subhead is another work from your collection. While one might be inclined to relate it to certain types of sculpture from the 1950s or 60s, I think the key difference is that it's made entirely from salvaged submarine parts. When I was moving into this studio, I saw this insanely huge elliptical form in a parking lot. And it turned out that it was three quarters of an American submarine, which had the history of this kind of failed American power structure in, in form. And I decided to treat it as deductive and additive sculpture material. And it was actually one of the most exciting, you know, kind of sculpture or endeavors I've ever had. I've always been enamored by the simplicity of Anthony Caro's plasma cuts and tack welds to kind of put things together. And having the Caro in the studio while I was making these sculptures really wound up informing the deconstruction and the construction of it in a way that I don't think that I would have been able to do without having this thing sit side by side. Death Cult 6150 is the most recent example in an ongoing photographic series, a body of work that, that started quite early on for you. This series was kind of started in 2004 and stopped. And then recently I kind of decided that I really enjoyed making that series. I had been doing collages by hand on paper, but these were a different way for me to kind of travel and compile things and kind of work on things via a, a computer. 
they wind up having different layers and different effects kind of added to them, almost as if it's a virtual collage. This one seems almost to me like a lineage to Brissaille. And the graffiti series to me, you know, kind of represented his sensibility of sculpture. It had a lot of depth in the photograph. The medium or body of work for which you've perhaps received the greatest acclaim is your, your investigation to ceramics. You've found many different ways to address scale, abstraction, representation, and very experimental patinas. It's the very first time I've ever hung a ceramic. I recently, with this series, started to do what's known as a luster glaze, which is something that a lot of the Fontana crucifixes have. And a luster glaze is a, is a, is a slightly different technique of firing, but it produces these kind of beautiful pearlescent mirrored colors. I love the kind of symbolism of this kind of frozen, completely kiln-fired, heated, burned, fired heart.